Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. I found this story on Reddit and thought that I would share. Missing in Maine. I found this on Unresolved Mysteries. What happened to four-year-old Kurt Newton in 1975? I started researching this story when I was working on the Dennis Martin story. The two cases are similar as both of these were young children who went missing in a national park in a camping area. But as I began to do some research on the story of Kurt Newton, I came across some links to some stories that some people at the time believed might have been connected to his disappearance. So I decided to look into those stories and I found some information on a couple of the cases this was all, these all took place very close to this place. It was in Canada where this young child went missing. And so I decided to, to look into those stories. And I am going to talk about those in some upcoming videos. I hope you'll enjoy. Kurt Newton was an adorable little boy with a close-knit family. He was happy growing up in the mid-1970s. With blonde hair and blue eyes, he was said to be a striking little boy. His parents, Jill and Ron, also had a daughter named Kimberly. In 1975, the family was camping. It was Labor Day weekend at the Natanas Point Campground or Coburn Gorge Campground area in northern Maine. Along with the family were three other families from their neighborhood in Manchester, Maine. By all accounts, it had been a really fun vacation weekend. In 1975, the campground was described as small and remote with 58 camping spots in the Chain of Ponds Wilderness Township, which is about six miles from the Canadian border. At around 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, August the 31st, the Newton's world started to shift upside down. That Sunday morning, Jill and some of the other moms had gone to use the bathrooms to clean their clothing, to rinse the mud and stuff from the children's shoes and other clothing. Ron Newton, Kurt's father, had left the campground in his truck to go get firewood. Kimberly and Jill saw Kurt riding around on his big wheel tricycle at the time. They thought he may have followed his father's truck. He was riding up and down a gravel roadway. Jill reported she was the only one in the bathhouse for less than 10 minutes when she came out to hang the freshly rinsed shoes on the clothesline. She didn't see Kurt anywhere. She did the normal calling around as the mother will do and listening for the plastic wheels of the big wheel on the gravel. After several minutes, she began to ask the other campers if they had seen Kurt on his tricycle or big wheel. None of the other campers had seen him. A little girl, 12 years old at the time, claimed that she did see him earlier on the tricycle. Jill reportedly instantly believed that someone had taken Kurt. Now, this was her first thought, not that maybe he had ridden off down the road um, or maybe just had gone back to their campsite or someplace else. She said she instantly believed that someone had taken him. She stated that he was so afraid of the dark and the woods that he would never have gone into the woods by himself. 
A campground employee later found the tricycle parked just off of the logging campground road. At this time, I don't think the employee even knew about the missing little boy and didn't think why this big wheel tricycle was out there on this logging road. The other families tried to calm Jill down and tell her that he would be found in no time, but he never was. The campers quickly formed their own little search party, and Maine Fish and Game Wardens were notified, and they joined the search. Kurt was four years old. He was born in 1971. He was last seen wearing a navy blue jacket with baseball emblems, a navy blue sweatshirt, a red jersey, red and black corduroy pants, white socks with dark brown high top shoes. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. Kurt was last seen in the remote Natanas Point Campground in Chain of Ponds, Maine, which is six miles from the Canadian border. Do they think that someone may have taken him across the Canadian border? Kurt's family stated he was very shy and didn't like being separated from his mother even for a short time. He had no history of wandering away without permission, and his parents do not believe that he went into the woods. An extensive search of the surrounding area included the use of bloodhounds and military helicopters. Turned up no signs of Kurt. Police believe that he became confused while trying to get back to the campsite and went in the wrong direction. Do they believe that he drove his or rode his tricycle or big wheel to this place where it was later found and then got tired of riding so he started walking and became lost? Um, this is what police believe. They theorized that he went in the wrong direction. The night of his disappearance, temperatures dropped in the area to below freezing. He couldn't have survived long if he had been out in the elements without shelter. His parents, however, believed that someone abducted him and took him across the border into Quebec. French language missing child's posters were distributed. After years had passed and Kurt became old enough to be in school, his parents mailed posters with his picture to every school district in the United States and Canada. Kurt has never been found and is presumed to have been abducted. If they think that it's possible that this small child died from exposure, would his body not have been found eventually or his clothing or some items other than just the big wheel? Is it possible that someone was in that campground area looking for young children to take? This day would turn out to be this family's worst nightmare. As word traveled across Maine about his disappearance, family and friends jumped into action to join the search. The media was alerted and began to put stories out there. 1,500 volunteers searched the dense woods. Now, this could be very similar to what happened in the Dennis Martin case. I go back to that again. So many people came in, and it was so unorganized. And people were going off in different directions, walking over top of footprints, that it's possible that Kurt's footprints, a small child, that small, um, maybe others walking over top of these footprints, over top of other clues, could have caused clues to have become lost. The chain of events may have seemed mundane, but each piece adds to the puzzle. The day before Kurt went missing, Kurt and his sister were playing around the campground, and the weather was damp. 
leaving the children's clothing and stuff muddy. They had been playing in, in the mud. The next morning, his mother decided to clean off their shoes and things in the camp's bathrooms. This was about 50 yards from the camp site. Kurt's father had built the campfire that morning and said that he needed to get more firewood, so he set off in his truck to, to go get more firewood. Now, Kurt was outside riding his big wheel. I don't know where the sister was at this time. The mother is 50 yards away in the uh, campsite's bathrooms with some other women. They were washing their clothes. A witness in the campground said that they saw Kurt pedaling his uh, tricycle, and they believed that he, as they thought back on it once they discovered that he was missing, and they started thinking about him riding his tricycle, they believed that he tried to follow his father. Maybe he had asked to go with his father, and his father told him no, and they believed that the child tried to follow the father and may have followed him out of the campgrounds and became lost. Now, this person who said that they saw him riding the tricycle didn't realize until they were asked later and they started thinking about it and they said that he was probably trying to follow the father. His tricycle was found alongside the road. It doesn't say how far away. NewEngland.com reported that over the next 11 days, more than 3,000 people, including Maine's governor, joined the search for Kurt. No clues were found to lead to any, um, you know, no real clues were ever found. People asked the question, did the four-year-old wander into the woods? His family adamantly says there's no way he would not have gone into the woods by himself. Did he encounter wildlife unexpectedly? Did he ride his tricycle outside of the campgrounds and maybe encountered, just like I'll go back once again to Dennis Martin, it may have been speculated that he may have encountered a bar. Um, maybe the, the sound of the tricycle's big wheel on the gravel on the road may have startled a, an animal. Did any families in the area and immediately nearby the border on the Canadian side, were they ever interviewed and reported ever seeing that someone show up with a small little boy? Did any store owners or gas station owners ever say someone came in with a small child? What followed has been termed the most extensive wood search in the history of Maine. But all the thousands of volunteer searchers ever found were unanswered questions. So Ron and Jill Newton, these were the parents, will sometimes let their minds drift back to the day that the little boy went missing. This was Labor Day weekend. Hour by hour, they try to come up with something that they might have overlooked. They try to hold on to that moment, August the 31st, 1975. It had been a great weekend, camping with their children, Kimberly, age six, and Kurt, age four. That Friday, the Newtons first arrived. It was their first trip with the recently acquired tent trailer, that they called it. They gathered wood along an abandoned logging road nearly a mile from their campsite. Saturday, their friends arrived, and Kimberly raced her bicycle through mud puddles, and Kurt tried to keep up with her on his big wheel tricycle. It was the end of summer, and everyone was enjoying their evening meals together, sitting around a campfire. Sunday morning broke with a heavy mist, 
Ron got up to build a fire to take the chill out of the morning air and used up the last little bit of firewood that he had. Kurt, who had been starting to get a cold, slept a little bit late. And when he woke up, he said, I'm glad Daddy built a fire because I was cold. So now the little girl who was six would ride her bicycle around the camp. And the little boy would try to follow her and try to keep up with her. They said that he would never go out into the woods. And sometimes the sister would go out into the woods and try to get him to come and play hide and seek but he would never go into the woods. And his mom asked him one morning, the sister was making fun of him, kind of teasing him, you know, the way children will do each other, and was saying, he's such a little baby, because he ran back to his mother when she tried to get him to go play in the woods. And his mom asked him, why don't you want to play out in the woods? And he said, because monsters are there. So... It was similar to what Dennis Martin and his brother and the other two two or three little boys that were with that group, they had been playing kind of a game of hide-and-seek in the woods. And Dennis was the younger of the, the group. He was only six. So that morning after they had a big breakfast, The mom began to clean up the breakfast, and she gathered up all of their mud-soaked clothing from the day before. The children had on their sneakers from the day before. They were covered in mud. So that morning, they put on different shoes, and the mom took their shoes and other items to the local bathhouse, along with a couple of the other moms in the group, and they washed the clothes out. The little girl, Kimberly, began to play a game, and Kurt was riding his tricycle around the campsite. Ron decided to go after more firewood, so he took his axe and drove off. This is where everything changed and became troubled. This is when Ron and Jill, the parents, try to go back in time and remember before that moment. A friend in the campground remembered hearing Kurt yelling, Daddy, Daddy, as he jumped on his tricycle and tried to ride behind his father trying to keep up with him. This is when the mystery begins. So now, 12-year-old Lou Ellen Hansen was returning from a walk when she saw a little boy riding past her on a tricycle. She called out to the child and said, Hey, do you know where, do your parents know where you are? But the boy made no reply and continued to pedal, to pedal on toward the campground. So she just let it go. She thought he's just a child who's at the campground. He's going to ride his tricycle back. And she went on. So now this road that she was talking about, she says it, they said that this road forks and about a quarter of a mile from where this took place is the campground. And he was riding, according to her, he was riding toward the campground. I don't know how long this was after the child left the campground, but to the right, it continues for a mile and then leads way to a heavy undergrowth. Jack Hansen, this is the father of the da of the girl, Llewellyn, who saw the child earlier. Now, her father, Jack Hansen, was a volunteer caretaker for the campground. He found the tricycle just before the steep rise that leads to a dump. It was off the road at the edge of the woods. Thinking that the tricycle had just been discarded, Hansen not having heard about the child being missing at that point, just thought that this was someone who had dumped this tricycle and left it. So he carried it and he put it atop a trash heap. And then he drove back to the campground. 
So after the mother had cleaned and washed out the sneakers, she came back outside to hang the sneakers on the clothesline. We'd only been gone about 10 minutes, and I didn't see her anywhere on his tricycle. I started walking around asking campers if they'd seen him riding his tricycle. He was hard to miss as he had a head full of very blonde hair. I began to think he may have gone with his father to get firewood. But when they rounded the corner, they didn't see him anywhere. She's walking around the campground asking people if they've seen a child riding a tricycle. This Jack Hanson, this groundskeeper, overhears this, and he comes up and he tells her he found the tricycle along the road and took it to the dump. So they went, they go out to the dump, and it was his tricycle. It was a big wheel tricycle, but with no sights of Kurt along the, uh, you know, along the road. They didn't see him. So the mother instantly goes into this panic mode where she believes someone has taken the child, and she says, "My God, someone's taken him." These were her very first words. The men quickly reassured her that he probably just went after his father. Dwayne Lewis, who was fish and game warden, a game warden inspector, was about 75 miles south of the chain of ponds when he got a call from the regional game warden that they had a lost child. A small search party was organized. A few game wardens and a few volunteers showed up to volunteer to search for the child. So he arrived at the campground at around 4 p.m., and they already had about 30 searchers ready to start searching. He he really had thought that this child would be home before dark. Kurt had always been fascinated with helicopters, and Jill was certain that he would respond to a game warden calling from him from a loudspeaker. Now, they did the same thing in the Dennis Martin search. His father went up into a helicopter with the searchers, and he used a loudspeaker to fly around calling out for Dennis, hoping that Dennis would hear his voice, his father's voice, and come out where he could be seen. So they did this same thing in the search for this little boy. His mother said that he would always run out to look at helicopters when they flew overhead, and she thought certainly he would if he heard someone calling his name. So they went up in this helicopter and they called Kurt. Your mommy and daddy want you to come back. Please follow me to the camp. Follow the helicopter. So they You know, they flew around looking, and they never did spot him. That night, the temperature dropped to 26 degrees. His mother couldn't think anything but how scared the little child must be. And she thought, why doesn't, he was thinking, why doesn't my mommy come and find me? So it was put out on the Manchester Main News that night at 7 p.m. about the missing child, and local people who knew his parents all came and volunteered, and soon streams of cars from Manchester were heading north to help in this search. By early the next morning, a bloodhound team scented on Kurt's pajamas. A year earlier, the same bloodhounds had been instrumental in tracking a two-year-old child who had been lost in the woods. And they let the hounds smell Kurt's pajamas, and the hounds bolted from the camp and ran about 10 yards and then became confused and pretty much just went around in circles. The weather became worse, and it was dark and damp and miserable, with a fog setting in. Everyone was soaking wet and cold. The searchers began to realize the task at hand. The helicopter circled overhead, and Jill, his mother, often went out into the woods with a few other people searching for the child. She was just going on her mother's instinct, and she was searching in the area where he was last seen. 
She had this gnawing feeling that he had maybe crawled back into a dark cavern or someplace like that to try to get in out of the bad weather and the cold. And she just couldn't, you know, give up the idea that he was still out there. But the men who went back into the caves and into the these caverns and other places, thick woods, trying to, they could find no sign of him. There were no tracks. There were no signs of a struggle. Nothing to imply that he had been taken by someone who just so happened to be driving by. There were no discarded clothes or shoes that might have come off. Um, there was no blood. The hounds that were on his trail using the scent from his pajamas ran around in circles, confused and not picking up the boy's smell in any direction. Well, I believe that that is because he was riding this tricycle around in circles in the camp. So the dogs were given his pajamas that he'd had on just before, you know, getting dressed that morning. And they picked up his scent, but he was all over the campground. This is probably the reason why they didn't go outside of the campground and run off into any one direction. Because his scent just confused them, going around in circles. By the fifth day, the governor of Maine had offered his commitment. He brought the helicopter in for one more flight. He organized some more searchers. But even with all the resources that were put out there, there was just no sign of Kurt. On Friday, September the 12th, the search officially ended. Over 300 volunteers had searched the woods to look for Kurt for more than 10 days. The, the Newtons never discounted the idea that Kurt could have been abducted. Though it would have seemed random as far as the investigators were concerned. Now, see, this is the same scenario with Dennis Martin. His father never gave up the idea that he had been abducted because of the story that this one particular man and his family told. That they had heard this, this scream, and when they looked out, they saw this man carrying what they thought at first was some kind of bundle like a duffel bag but they later realized that it was a child and that the child was screaming now there were never no there was never a confirmation of this the um the searchers the people in the great smoky mountains searched they could never find anyone matching the description of this man it's possible that he did but just like in this case it seemed random it's possible that someone did take him is it possible that even someone who was in the campground camping saw this child alone, realized the father's gone, the mother's inside this other room, there's nobody around right now, it's my chance. That's possible as well. But they never found any signs of him. Um, the Newtons returned home with their daughter, who was still confused about what, what this meant. They spent thousands of dollars sending Kurt's picture to schools all across the United States. They, they thought that it was possible. Now, keep in mind, this was only a few miles from the Canadian border. It is possible if someone took him, they could have crossed the Canadian border with him. So they also sent out pictures uh, to schools in Canada as well. They thought maybe if someone had taken him and was trying to raise him as their own, that sending his picture out to these schools, eventually the child would be placed in a school. But nothing ever came of that. They received many letters from people all around the world with condolences and even a few pictures of children that were similar to Kurt, but they never, it never turned out to be him. They continued on with their lives the best that they could, still somewhat expecting Kurt to return home. Kim would often talk about her brother. Sometimes when she was in school, friends would come up to her and ask her questions. 
and she tried to keep his memory alive, but it became harder as the years passed. They tried non-traditional methods to search for their son over the years. Uh, His mother visited many psychics who offered their services. Now, this same thing happened with Dennis Martin. Psychics started calling in, giving their theories and giving their ideas about what had happened to him. But as the decades went by and nothing ever came of what the psychics told her, they, um, she says that almost every psychic that she visited said that they told her that he was still alive. All that remains of Kurt Newton's story is DNA from his family. In a case where a body was never found or anyone ever turned up claiming to be him. He would be 54 years old today if he was still alive. And if he had been taken and uh, let's face it and be realistic. Most people who abduct children are not abducting children with the intentions of raising them as their own, giving them a life. But we have seen cases where people have been taken and years later they turn up alive. It's possible. You can't rule that out. It's just so hard to wonder why. But keep in mind, and I've I've mentioned this before, these forests are so huge we see pictures of them on a map we see pictures of them in video or you know in uh, on google and we imagine how big they are but until you're right there and you're walking through it and there you have thick brush and downed trees and places where there are no paths and you're trying to get through a place where a four or six year old child could go um if a child is scared what does a child do when it's the most frightened run to its parents if the parents are not there it's going to run and hide somewhere and it, like the mother of this little boy thought it was possible that he did just that because he was so afraid of the woods from doing some googling kurt's grandmother died in 2005 and he was listed as one of the grandchildren that survived. So the family has went through their lives these past 50 years under the assumption and the belief that he is still alive. So some people are, are saying that they are suspicious of this groundskeeper who says that he found this tricycle and put it in the trash dump. Some people are saying, did he not ever see this child on this tricycle? And being that he was the groundskeeper for a campground, or children would be, would he not have gone to the campground first and asked, you know, did any child maybe lose this tricycle? But he always said that he found it near the area where the... um, Firewood had been cut where the father had first picked up firewood. Did the child's memory allow him to ride that to that same exact place? And was the father not there? Had the fa- How had the father missed him? If the father drove straight to this place where the firewood was cut, collected some firewood, or was still out there collecting firewood at that point, and drove straight back to the campground, how did he miss the child along the road? Did the father go elsewhere after he got firewood? So it just seems kind of suspicious. Some people are suspicious of the father. They believe some people in the comments here are saying, was the father thoroughly questioned about, you know, did you see the child? Did he, you know, did you know that he was trying to follow you? Why did you, how did you miss him? And, and, you know, just some people are suspicious of the father and some people are suspicious of this groundskeeper. It says here, I wonder about an animal attack. 
there are black bears and probably mountain lions in that area of Maine, especially in the 70s. Is it possible that the child could have been attacked? It's probably more likely that if he were attacked by a mountain lion, his body might have been carried away from the area. But a black bear, and this was another thing that was talked about with the Dennis Martin case in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, there are black bear, and it is possible that a young child that small could have been attacked. But where were the clothing? Why was there never any signs of any blood or anything a lot of people the a consensus of the people in the comments seem to believe that he was abducted now like i said before most people who abduct young children like that abduct them and are their intentions are not good they're not abducting children because they're lonely and they want a child to raise they abduct them for perverted reasons and most of the time they carry out their sick twisted desires with a young child and then they discard that child they don't normally release them to go back home to tell what happened to them this is more recent kurt ronald newton this is considered to be a non-family abduction so even the doe network and the uh, International Center for Missing Persons believes this to be an abduction. A team of investigators interviewed everyone known to have been at the campground. Some people were even given polygraph tests. One camper reported that she had seen a white station wagon roaring out of the campground, leaving a trail of dust on the same day that Kurt disappeared. But there was no such car registered at the campground. Nobody else reported seeing it. And reported and experienced trackers reported that they never found any evidence of any vehicle traffic on the logging road. Oh. The father had gone down this logging road to the place where there was an area where you could collect firewood. And they said that other than that, they knew of no other traffic out there. This is what leads some people to be suspicious of the father. There have even been a few comments that said, was the child ever even in, on the tricycle that morning? Was this whole story from the mother and the father made up that the child maybe died during the night? or something happened to him, or a moment of anger, or something like that, and that they made up this story to cover it up, and that the father, when he left to go get firewood, supposedly, went to dispose of Kurt's body. Now, there's been no indication that the police or anyone believes that, but this is just some questions that some people have in the comments. The police sent descriptions of Newton throughout the United States and Canada. A call came from a man in Connecticut who had returned from camping in the Canadian Rockies. He said that he noticed a small blonde-haired boy staring at him. He said he was struck by how nervous the boy seemed and the man that he was with, he said he saw the same boy when he looked at Kurt's missing poster, and he was, a, he was certain that this was the little boy that he had seen. That same week, a call came from Vermont. Two waitresses were sure that they had seen Kurt in their restaurant. So is it possible that he was taken and left Maine and traveled down through these other states and maybe was brought down to the southern part of the country where everyone was searching for him in the northern part of the country. The investigating agency was the Maine State Police, and their phone number is 207-657-5710. But I do appreciate all my 
um, subscribers. I appreciate everyone who watches. And um, thanks for watching.